Um, well, welcome. Welcome to the 16th time of the Rata, 2013. Um, we are very, very happy to have you all here tonight. Um, I'm sure the rest of the team from the Center for Creative Arts would agree. We are very happy that this festival could take place this year. And thank you, guys, to everyone who made it possible, Tiny and the crew. Um, so... Center for Creative Arts at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. We'd like to acknowledge the presence of any um, UKZN executives, deans, heads of schools, student reps, or any city officials that may be with us tonight. Thank you for your support. Um, we appreciate all of it. Um, I'd like to introduce the first panel this evening, entitled Perspectives in South African Writing. And this is featuring um, Joanne Richards of South Africa, um, Cabello Katia of South Africa as well, and facilitated by Zukiswe Wana. So if they could please come to the stage and give them a round of applause. Good evening, Durban. Thank you very much for coming through and missing Isidingo and Generations and all those soppies. A round of applause, please. We start this time of the writer with the panel called Perspectives in South African Writing. And I have with me Kabelo Khatea and Joanne Richards. Joanne, you are originally from the Eastern Cape. Do you have any easier name like Koliswa or <laughs> Mobile or something, you know, that I can... That's yeah, no, that, I've, I've given you the easier version, actually. I mean, it really is. It's a very tonal thing. You have to say, Johanny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. Um, now, uh, Cabello, you wrote, uh, your first book came out in 2000, and you write books for the youth, generally, in Setswana. And your first book, Njeyamano uh, Fakesule, did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Okay. It came out in 2000, and Cabello was a miner, um, and he was working underground. And after this book came out, the CEO of his workplace was so excited that they had somebody who could write that he told Human Resources to uh, bring Cabello up from underground and um, have him become, uh, you know, in communicate, put him in the communications department. So you see, there is a chance for improvement if you decide you want to be a writer, at least if you work at the mine, Cabello does. <laughs> <laughs> how, has, how has the progression been for you? Your books have won awards. They are in schools. Um, how has that been for you? And do you have the guys underground, have they su suddenly started reading? Do they buy your books for schools, for their children? Yes, uh, uh, and I, I, I even I'm struggling with the, the bookshops in, in, in my area to, to provide uh, enough books for, 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 for colleagues and people who want to read my work. So I'm always fighting with them to get enough books. Yeah. Okay, uh, so anybody from Rustenburg uh, who might own a printing press there is possibility for fund uh, for, for making money there. So um, you, you tackle really big issues, despite the fact that you're writing for the youth. And one of the issues that you tackle is race. In one of your in your first book, you talk about a man who is a farmhand and he impregnates uh, the wife, um, the, the daughter of the farmer, and then he has to run away. Um, why the big issues? You know, is there some particular thing that gets you into that? In your other book, your last book, uh, Ndubudu, you also talk about uh, two boys, black and white, who are friends. And then as their friendship progresses, the father loses, the, the white father loses a job, and then he has to be employed by the black, um, the father of the black child. Can you tell us more? Why this particular issue? Do you still think that we have to answer the race question in South Africa? Yeah, I think, I think uh, 
most of the, the, the issues that I'm trying to, to tackle in my books are things that are happening in our daily, daily life. Mm. And most of them are, are true stories that are in my books, just mingled with fiction. <laughs> but most of them come from true stories. Okay, so, so you actually know a boy who... <laughs> I, I, I just want to make sure, because I've been looking for my white maid since the f my first book came out. So you actually... <laughs> Although I can't pay them. <laughs> you, so you actually know this situation in this particular book that happened, um, that actually happened, uh, where a guy lost his job and he got employed, he became an alcoholic, and then he got employed by somebody else. Wasn't there like any complex issues in that situation with, or I'm not gonna allow this guy to employ me because he is, um, well, 20 years ago, I would be employing him. Yeah, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a youth novelist, uh, I'm trying to contribute on nation building, okay. building a new rainbow nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we, we had each other as South Africans for, for many, many years. Not maybe only whites and blacks or black and white. Even among ourselves, as even black people to black people, we had ourselves. We have our own stories. We have our own history. And that is part of us. Mm. And then I, I, I think for us as, 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 as writers, we have to take a lead on nation building. Mm -hmm. We have to bring this, especially the the, the born freeze, because they don't have uh, the, 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 the memory, bad memories about each other, mm -hmm. and they are the future. And then we have to prepare them for for the future. Okay. So, so that that's my my contribution as a, as a nation builder. Wow, thank you, Joanne. You also tackle uh, you you take a rest as well in my brother's book. Um, a guy suddenly discovers he's not who he thought he was. Um, how was that received? Uh, how did you walk through that? Because I really enjoyed, I remember when it came out, I enjoyed the book so much that I was buying it for everybody um, that year for Christmas and birthdays and, you know, everything. So how did you tackle that? Um, and did you, did you feel that you were enough of an authority to talk about it? Or did you have people who raised their eyebrows and say, well, you know, you are at Vits, what do you know, you know? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't believe that writers need to be authorities. Mm. I, I think that we rummage around in uh, stuff that we see around us. And I, I think of myself as a sort of observer. I'm always watching, I'm always listening to people and so I, I don't come at writing from that point of view that I say I'm trying to tell you something. I'm exploring and I'm, I'm writing about things that I see and um, so um, you know I, yeah, I didn't really have much um, you know a reaction from people to say why are you writing about this? I mean I'm a I'm an African, I write what's around me. Excellent. And I've just finished reading your um, latest book, The Imagine Child, which is fantastic. Um, and again, in this book, you tackle another big issue, um, and the big issue of motherhood. Um, the, your character, Odette, your protagonist, constantly has to deal with an ex who thinks that she has a certain duty as a mother, but she gets into a space where sometimes she doesn't like her child, you know? Sometimes she's like, I love her because it's my child, but I don't like her very much. And um, how, did, how did you put yourself into that mind space? I'm <laughs> curious, because I thought it was very brave of you to write it. I mean, I have, I'm a mother and I am, yeah, you I've had, yeah, had yeah. <laughs> the point. I mean, I suppose I'm always trying to tackle the, the sort of difficult things, the, um, uh, the things that I hear. And I mean, this book isn't so much just about motherhood. I was trying to deal with our most basic formative relationships, those with our parents and our children. And though we are, we're so formed uh, um, by those relationships. And they can be they can be very difficult, um, you know. 
um, we're all damaged a little bit in some way to a greater or lesser extent, whether, you know, through, um, you know, genetically or from our upbringing. Um, you know, some of us more seriously, some of us less so. You know, you might have you get your bad back or your bad eyes hurt or whatever. And how you deal with the way you are, the way you sort of damaged, uh, determines the kind of adult you will become, and 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 ultimately the kind of parent. And um, I, I, in this, I, I was looking at. You, uh, is those sort of secret feelings that I sometimes hear parents admit to late at night after a few drinks. <laughs> Do you and feel like you're a sellout to the motherhood? <laughs> you, know, you know, these are things that people find difficult, uh, difficult to admit to in public. And that's, I mean, that's one of the, uh, the reasons I think that fiction is so important. It would be very difficult to tackle these kind of issues in non-fiction because, they are, you know, things are hard to verify, you can't get people to admit to certain things, and that's what you can do with fiction. You can explore the really difficult things, the, the issues that people find hard, hard to deal with. And, and I suppose through that, if I can just add to that, um, you know, I was looking at, when I started looking at that issue of our kind of parents, and I thought, you know, they sort of, those relationships are so fraught with guilt and blame and sometimes anger. But, you know, if, if, and everybody at a certain stage blames their parents for something or other. But if we blame our parents, then surely their parents are responsible for the way they were brought up. So no, how, actually, how back do you blame? No, no, no. no My no. parents' parents didn't have opera. We do. <laughs> There's a difference. I thought to myself, it's a bit... I tried to expand that because it occurred to me that it's a little bit like our relationship with the country mm. because it kind of stands in a way as both parent and child because we, we kind of blame it for, the way, for our damaged selves, for the way we turned out. And at the same time, m most of us feel a certain amount of guilt or responsibility for the way it turned out. So I was trying to play with those different levels, I suppose. Cabello. Um, in Njeng Manong Fagasoli, uh, one of the things that you do is you have a happy Sindane type of character there. Uh, for the non-South Africans amongst us, happy Sindane was a chap who came in the news for a long time who allegedly claimed he'd been stolen by a black family. And, um, yeah. And, and, and so you have a happy Sindane character because um, when this couple... Um, finally gets reunited, she has joined, um, she's joined South African Communist Party, uh, and then they finally get reunited. But then this child has been adopted by a colored family. And uh, tell us more about that. How did you, did Happy have anything to do with that inspiration? Because if it was after Happy Sindan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Happy Sindani's story is part of the, the story that really inspired me. Mm. Yeah, that's why I, I mentioned that uh, most of my stories come from true stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a writer, I normally feel like uh, sharing everything that I... If, if something hurts me or something makes me happy, mm. I would like to share it with, 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 my, with, 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 with my, my people, with... with Okay. With the readers. And, 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 your, and your protagonist in that particular story, Senatla, he, um, when he runs away from the farm, he decides that he's going to go to Botswana because he thinks he will be able to link up with Maria, his, his love, this woman who's pregnant with his child, um, and it should be acceptable because Sereta Kama has a British wife. And then when he gets there, the cousins and the family are not really, you know, that accepting. So what are your opinions on, you know, culture versus modernity? And, you know, every time some crazy thing happens, um, there are people who will raise their eyebrows and they'll say, okay, this shouldn't have happened. And then there are people who will shout at us and yell it down the line and say, oh, no, but it should happen. This is our culture. What's your take on culture? 
Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> yes, I know. I bring the big questions. <laughs> that's that's a, that's a big one because uh, really the, the custodians of culture they, they will kill me for it. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's that's my my my, my view. Uh, I think we remember... Do we have a homogeneous... Let me maybe just put it a little... Do we have a homogeneous African culture, do you think? Or do we have a homogeneous even South African culture? No, I don't think so. Okay. I, I don't think so. Yeah, so why don't we have man? Because you know in our culture, for instance, these this people who are following next, they're going to be taking, talking about un-African stuff like homosexuality, you know? So, you know, where does, where, where, where does modernity and tradition, you know, is, does culture keep changing and what is it that we discard and what do we go forward with, you know, particularly in this particular situation with St. Atla, what, what should he have taken with him and should he have just said, oh, I'm going to emulate Userete Kama because now, you know, I'm a, I'm a Mtswana and I can do this. Yeah, running away from, from, from Mr. Fanikar, from the farm. Mm. He, he's, uh, the, the boy thought he will be free in Botswana because, like you said, Seretakama married a white woman. And he thought that, hey, I have also, because the, the, what, what, what really uh, influenced uh, the, the relationship between Senata and, and, and Maria is that he, he was brought up in a farm and uh, he will take uh, on, a, on a donkey chart or horses, he will take Maria to, to school. And he, will, he was responsible for everything in the farm. Mm -hmm. And to Maria, that was a man that, that, he think, that, she, that, that means she deserved. A hard worker, mm -hmm. a man who can bring food to the table. Mm -hmm. And his father and the, the, the community want him to marry an African girl. Mm -hmm. But deep down in his heart, he knows that he loves Maria, not anybody else. You make it sound so romantic. I thought, I will be free from, from, from uh, oppression or the law of the country. But he, he, that, that was not true. Because he, he, he fell into, a, into another trap of, 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 of the, the, the Zutwana culture. Mm -hmm. Because they, they forced him to marry a cousin. And he, he have never seen that cousin. This cousin was, was studying in, 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 in UK. And then they want him to marry her. <laughs> we, we, in Sichuan, we say, you have to marry your, your cousin so that the, the... The world stays in the family. Yeah, can remain in the family. But must not go to other, to other people. But it was going to be like her world, isn't it? Because Yenai is just a farmhand. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's why now he decided to run back, to go back, back to South Africa, back to oppression, back to, to apartheid. Okay. Because he was not free. He thought he would be free. But here is culture, another obstacle. And when he was running away, he went through a lot of very terrible farm, farm owners and, and farm hands. <laughs> Okay, he, he, he suffered, he suffered, he suffered a lot. Mm -hmm. But he, he thought, in a farm, I'll be free. But he realized that there are laws and rules and, and everything that oppresses him, that is against his will or his wishes. He, he really, the only woman that he knew was Maria. Mm. Yeah. And, and <laughs> like I said, this comes from most of the true stories. Okay. It's nearly part of my life because mm. I... Uh, it happens that uh, when I was 17 years, I you fell in love farm. with this little young woman, white mm. woman. Mm. And I have to run away from that, that town and return back to my, to my hometown. So we but know how he ended up in the mines. I was a policeman, <laughs> and the law will not allow me to do, to do that. I used to watch a lot of movies, and I saw <laughs> white people kissing each other, looking after each other. And in my culture, I can't even kiss my mother. <laughs> yeah, I can't kiss my mother. If I'm happy, I come home and there's a lot of people here, my mom and dad, and I can't go and hug my mom and kiss her. I can't do that in my culture. Mm. But I used to see white people doing that on films. And I, I thought, if I can marry a white woman, I'll be the happiest man. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Joanne, uh, I'm going to ask Joanne to read a bit of an excerpt, and then uh, I will 
Kabelo, may I ask you, after Joanne has read, because this is in Setswana, to just, this is his latest, this is your latest, yeah? Yeah, this is I would ask, I would ask him to just give a brief summary for you guys, and anybody please, uh, the books are available in the lobby. When we finish, you can um, go and get some copies. Um, it's encouraged to know more than one African language in South Africa, guys. We have 11. No, at least four or five, so Setswana could be the other language. It's one of the national languages. Um, so I'm going to ask you to kindly like just, um, just summarize when Joanne is done with her reading, and then maybe I'll open up to the floor and we can discuss. And anybody who asked their questions in the shortest amount of time, and make them sound very intelligent because these people are very intelligent. Um, we will be giving away some free books. So we'll give Cabello's books. We will give um, the facilitator's first book and we will give Joanne's latest book. If you ask clever questions. Um, okay, just to, to tell you, um, this this little section is between, the, as you said, the, the main character is Odette, and her daughter is Mandy, um, and, um, and um, Melissa is her friend. Okay. So, I know why no one plays with me, Mandy told her outside the school gate one day. She must have been six at the time. She always came out alone, a potato sack among all those rangy legs and laughing faces. Is it something we can fix? Yes, we must buy Pokemon cards. Everyone has them except me. They spend all break swapping them. If I had some, I could join in. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go buy some. They stopped off at the CNA and bought an album for a nascent collection. Hell of a price, but some things were worth it. What's your favorite character, the assistant asked, but Mandy didn't know. She rarely watched TV. Odette bought a starter pack and then, for good measure, a handful of booster packs. She had to be sure Mandy would have some valuable cards. But how would they know which were, were which? Then she had a brainwave. Melissa, of course, whose stepson was older. Oh, he's outgrown that stuff. Come on over. I find those bloody cards in every drawer and stuck in every skirting board. Damon was reluctant to part with his, she had to say, truly magnificent collection until she flashed indecent amounts of cash, took after his father, that boy. <laughs> Saving for a skateboard, Melissa muttered, caught between pride and shame. She poured them both a coffee from Hannes's shiny espresso machine that took up half the kitchen. Part of the deal was that Damon coached them through all the funny handshakes of this latest cult. Odette began to enjoy herself. They could learn this, Mandy and she. It wasn't so hard. Pikachu wasn't strictly valuable, but he was popular because everyone liked him. A good mainstay for any collection. The shiny holographic cards obviously were the most valuable. They spent the afternoon, Melissa and she drinking countless coffees, while Mandy and she memorized the three kings. She became quite lightheaded. It was probably the caffeine, but it seemed like something more. Mandy was intent rather than giddy. She frowned, comparing Damon's cards to her memory of what the other girls had. She made deliberate decisions and she learned her lessons well. Hell, this is great. You can do this, Mandy. Tomorrow you'll be able to swap with the best of them. Tomorrow I'll have friends. And Mandy smiled. You'll totally have the most awesome collection, said Damon. Most girls aren't so hot at collecting. And this Venusaur, I was lucky to find him. I shouldn't really even give him up. Think skateboard, Melissa said, and they all laughed, even Mandy. The next morning, Mandy was up and dressed before Odette. No hairbrush assault on a screaming, ducking head. They were at the school gates early. I need the time for swapping, she said. At home time, Odette was there to see her come out, in a cluster perhaps, skipping a bit, calling her buyers, wouldn't that be something? Mandy exited last and alone. She said nothing as she climbed in, album on her lap. Her expression was neutral. No light of triumph at a job well executed, which it surely must have been. No one could have faulted her collection. 
but Mandy never did show much on her face. Let me see. She handed her album over and Odette opened to an empty page. She turned to the next and the next. What happened, she asked. Where's your collection? Didn't you swap? I swapped and I swapped. I swapped before school and then I swapped even harder at break time. So what happened? They laughed at me. But they swapped from me, but no one swapped back to me. She thought that must be the purest hatred she had felt in her life. She often wondered what happened to those children, whether they grew up hale and hearty with all their faculties intact, because that day she visualized them maimed and mutilated. With exquisite clarity, she wished them dead. I remember when I, when I read that, and um, being a mother, I just remembered also something that I often say, that people who say children are angels are people who've never had children. Have a long day. Yeah, with my, my two characters, uh, Rapula, which means in, literally means the one who was born during a rainy day, <laughs> and his friend, uh, Ati. Rapula, uh, gave him a, 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 a very nice uh, nickname. He, called, he used to call him Mampuru. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then with these two characters, a white boy and a, and a black boy, I was trying to, to break the walls that, that we, we have some walls. We are building them a little bit higher and thicker every day between us, as, especially as white South African, black South African. There are white South Africans who are building those fences and those walls just because they have perceptions that people, black people may come and kill us, may come and, and destroy us. But with these two characters who are born free, who are attending the same school at Bergsdorf in Rustenburg, I was trying to show the people that this generation, the born free people, the born free children, they can change this country because we really have a wonderful country. We want people who will love this country and govern it very, very, very well. And this is a wonderful country. During the World Cup, the, the, this, book, the, this book was set uh, during the, the, the World Cup in 2010. Before the soccer games, we have the first rugby game played in Soweto a place where petrol bombs were manufactured during the struggle, mm -hmm. a place where most of the white South Africans have never set their foot there because they have a perception that people there will not welcome them well. They will kill them, especially as rugby supporters. But this, two, this young boy, Rapula, went with, 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 with his friends to the first rugby game, a curry cup game, in Soweto, in Orlando Stadium. Mm -hmm. And that is part of our history. Mm -hmm. And uh, after that, I, I took these two boys to Fentus mm -hmm. Because before the World Cup, the great guy, Eugene Terrablanche, was assassinated mm -hmm. by two black young boys. Mm -hmm. And everybody was asking questions. Are people there, are black people in the, in, around Fentersdorf and in their farms, are they safe? Mm -hmm. And that is why I, I, I took a, that, 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 that dipstick and try and test the, 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 the water. Okay. I took these two characters and I took them there after Eugene Carol Blanche's uh, death. I took them to, 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 to Mampuru's, to, to Oadi's uh, uncle who is a leader, also a leader in the AWD, okay? And his farm is Kafar's Kral. Mm. <laughs> so I took these two boys to Kafar's Kral. And there is a farm by that name in that area. So that's why I said most of the stories are, are true. Mm. We may be enjoying the World Cup and saying we brought, uh, we, 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 uh, we organized the most successful and wonderful World Cup, soccer World Cup. <laughs> But we still have our issues that people don't know about us as South Africans. 
Absolutely. But it is for us to, 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 to correct them, mm. especially the next generation. Because us, our minds are polluted with a lot of stuff. <laughs> we are not like our children. Mm -hmm. if, if my son sees uh, a white young, young, young person, he will say, Abu Tiobu, with that brother. But if I saw a, a man, a white man of, in my age, I will say to the other black people, Liburu, Liburu. <laughs> so there's a difference between me and my children. Mm -hmm. they, they, are, they are friends who are white. Uh, they visit each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so... That's why I decided to, let me do something as, 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 as a youth novelist. Let me write for this, this, this generation. I, I, my dream and my wish is that most of my, my work can be translated into other languages so that all these children can read this. Because as a, a writer, when I, I look at people as a writer, I don't see Botswana, I don't see the Zulus, I don't see the Chinese, I don't see the, the English people. I see, the, I see people, mm -hmm. and I may use I may be using Sezwana as a tool to take my story to the people, but I'm not writing for the Botswana readers or the Botswana speaking people. Mm. I, I, I write to, to all nations. Mm. That's that's what we have as, as writers. We are color blind. We, <laughs> we, we, we we are nation builders. We are nation builders. Okay. Thank you very much, Cabello, and uh, for that summary, and Joanne for the reading. I will open up the questions to the floor. Um, so any clever blacks and clever whites, <laughs> feel free to ask questions. And preferably not so clever. Yes, I clever know, black, number one in red. <laughs> Sir? <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> but, but the question that I would uh, want to ask uh, would be, um, I'm sure you, after writing a lot of books or novels, you would, uh, I would want to know, does it happen that after writing a book and pub publishing it, you realize there's a chapter missing in that book? <laughs> I, want to, I want to understand that part. Thank you. Are you asking that to... Both of us or one Both of us? Both of you. Okay. okay. Missing you. chapters. Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> so that she can write off his power. answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, on my side, I, I will never take a book to a, a publisher if I'm not happy myself. Most of my manuscript, before I could, I, I read and reread rewrite and write and rewrite until I feel happy. After reading my manuscript, I always expect tears from my eyes. And then I knew, I know, I know that this is what maybe my maker or somebody wants me to do. Then I'll, I'll feel happy. I, I've never felt like I could have done this, I could have done this. Yes, attending workshops and attending conferences I've gained a lot of experience. So I apply that, what, what I've learned from, from to, in, in, my next, uh, in my next books. But I've never felt like I, I could have done better in any of my books. Joanne, uh, do you, does your mascara run after finishing your, <laughs> reading your manuscripts? Waterproof. Um, oh, waterproof. Tighty <laughs> <laughs> tight. Um, well, I, I've got, one part of that uh, that I agree with and one part that I'm different in. I also rewrite and rewrite and rewrite five, six, seven times, but I'm never happy. <laughs> Often I'm sort of tugging it back as my publisher's pulling it out of my grasp. Um, and that's why I even hate, I don't know about missing chapters, but I, I hate reading m my work in print because... I go all cringy because I, I always, you know, I'm always trying to be better, I suppose. And each book I'm trying to be better than the last book. And so I suppose I could go on rewriting for 10 years, actually, <laughs> or more, you know. I just, um, yeah. So 
Yeah, I don't know if that answers. The Thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, we've got two questions here in front. Uh, at the back? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is going to go for Joanne. Uh, just now you said when you write, you rewrite, you can rewrite for 10 years. And I admire the piece you just read. And my question is simply saying, is it possible for that to be translated into something like on TV or a cartoon? Because if I try to read that to my son, I think he will like only grasp a few pages. So do you see your work improving to being casted on stage or being on movies? Because it's very heartwarming for kids to know. Um, I, I, I mean, it's everybody's uh, wish to be, I suppose, made into a movie or a TV, um, a TV movie or, or something. And I suppose it, um, it depends on whether you know, somebody sees the potential and, and buys it for that purpose. Um, my, my first book, I sold the rights for a movie, but like most movies, they never raised the money and never got made. But, um, but I suppose, I mean, you know, it's, it is an adult book. It's not, um, I think it would be hard for kids. I don't know how old you are. So there, there you have it, Mom. You are actually supposed to be the one reading the book. <laughs> it's outside in the lobby. When we're on break, you can get a copy, and Joanne will be very happy to sign it for you. Another question. Um, my question is for Joanne. Um, what I would like to know is the excerpt that you read for us. Is it a metaphor for um, a struggle that's going on nowadays? Since we live in a world where we have many influences, um, we as people have a tough choice to make whether we should remain originals to conform to the new ideals or to adapt. I suppose, you know, it's, uh, I, I, mean, I haven't thought of that, but it's funny that always when you write a book, then people see things and then afterwards you say, oh, yes, absolutely, exactly, that's exactly what I intended with that. <laughs> so um, I, that's, I mean, that sounds, you know, valid, and, and I think that's probably true. You know, a lot of things happen when you write sort of intuitively. And, um, you know, you, you don't always think out exactly, because you're writing a story, and you hope that it resonates with, on a lot of levels. And one level is the, the personal level, the personal story with, uh, you know, that you hope is exciting and that people will read to the end. And then there are other levels with re which resonate with the way we view the country, the way we live in it. So I hope it has all those, all those levels. So... Yes, I hope it does. I hope it is. <laughs> okay. Um. <clears throat> okay. She, she's had her hand up for a while. Right there. Yes. Um. No, I mean you can ask, and then we go to her, and then we come up front to Jackie. Um, the question is for both of you. Um, what inspires you to write these books, even though you face obstacles like rejection? What gives you <laughs> to like, continue to write because I was ready to give up writing only to find that my poem will be published wow. for this book. Congratulations. Oh. <laughs> Just want to know. <laughs> I was so excited I spilled my water. <laughs> <laughs> you answer first. <laughs> hey, okay. Miss, hey? All right. Um, you know, each time at the, you know, the point where my, my book's sort of going out there, I say, this is too hard. I'm never going to write another book. And then I do. Um, and I, I don't know why. I think that it's just was my life stream. It's what I wanted to do. And it's, what, it's how I see myself. I might do other things. I teach and I do this and that. But I see myself... As a writer, it's my heart and soul. It's when I'm not writing, I feel odd. So, yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, 
sorry, Colonel. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think that that is why I I'm an author and and working at the mine. I'm working at the mine to as a father to provide for my family, to be a responsible citizen, to pay tax, and be able to pay my. <laughs> Britain Zuma and, and, and the rest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not doing that maybe because I want to be the present government's puppet or whatever, because I, I'm not that one. So uh, that, that makes me free as, as, as a writer, because I don't want to be owned by anyone, or a political party or whoever. Uh, it makes me free. Uh, I'm always free, free to write, free to be me. <laughs> so I don't have a lot of, 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 of pressure or, or obstacles. Because I, I think I'm, I'm free, I'm free. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm Jenny Sprung. Mm -hmm. um, Joanne, if I could just ask, mm -hmm. you mentioned earlier that uh, you explore in fiction things perhaps that are difficult to... Um, pinpoint in, in non-fiction. Uh, do you find that you use uh, bizarre stories or things that are unreal? Because when I've read your books, they, they resonate so with the reality. So I just wondered how you mix reality and uh, the bizarre or the imagination. You know, I, d I, don't, I don't think I do write bizarre. I think I'm a very... Um, I, you know, my early training was as a journalist. And I think I write as a journalist. I, everything is researched. I research everything. And, and everything is true. It's, you know, like the town that I set it in is true. The, the way they walk to the cafe, it's true. And the, the kind of, like you were saying, a lot of the, a lot of the, the kind of texture and the, the stories that happen in the small town, the small free state town that I've set this book in, they, I, I kind of heard them. And I, I heard those stories. So, I mean, I, I see fiction as a way of reaching almost a, a greater truth in some ways because there are a lot of things that you can't, when you write nonfiction, you're bound to a certain extent to what you can so verify you can and what people would admit to. Whereas in fiction, you can, you can explore deeper than that, stuff that you've heard, stuff that you know happens, but that you, you can you know, you can go into in fiction, which would, yeah, which would be quite difficult. So it's, it, it's a mix of, you know, what the things that happened in this book didn't necessarily happen, but they could. And the texture and the background and the town and the attitudes, all those are, I think, real. And so, that's probably the reason why you're, when you submit a certain manuscript, your publisher says to you, it's too unrealistic, although it's fiction. <laughs> Um, yeah, Jackie. Uh, a quick one for uh, Brother Gabelo. Uh, just curious, what happened to your uh, burning desire to assimilate into uh, white culture? Uh, <laughs> secondly, how, how did you reconcile that burning desire? Because you say you were 17, and I'd imagine that was probably, I don't know, in the 70s, in the 60s, and the 70s, somewhere in the prime of apartheid, how did you reconcile that with the reality of the oppression of black people by the racist white dictatorship, yet you had this burning desire to assimilate into white culture? Thank you. Uh, oh, another big one. Uh, I think... Uh, as a person, from that desire, or maybe that that relationship, that that that, that <laughs> I think it's failed because it, 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 I've never seen that that young woman again in my life. <laughs> but I, I I have I learned to to love, especially to 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 love and and, and care and look and and and. and and, 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 and take care of, 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 of women. Something changed because I saw something different. Because in my, in, like I said, in my culture, I saw something different. I've never seen my dad kissing my mom. I can't even kiss my own mom. 
especially in front of my dad. He will kill me. <laughs> 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 I, I really, I really, I really learned something. How, but do you kiss your how, wife now? <laughs> since then, and I'm trying to teach my children that because the best children, the best way of loving your children is to love their mother. Mm. If you love their mother, then yeah. uh, really. You better up. And we've got our last question over there. Thank you. Uh, pardon my ignorance, but I've learned that words carry significance. You mentioned the fact that you, were, you are a nation builder. Yet you revert to the apartheid um, terminology that refers to the different cultures that exist within South Africa in reference to black and white. Um, I know at one stage the black consciousness movement tried to come up with the slogan that black is beautiful. But having read a couple of texts and having experienced life, I have come to a realization that there's nothing positive attached to the word black. Yet, you make reference to that. How do I get around that? Dude, I'm not sure where you, who you were listening to, but anyway. <laughs> black helps. <laughs> Can you rephrase it? Uh, <laughs> You're getting the hard ones, dude. Um, well, I don't know. Can you, can you rephrase that, Joanne? Okay. Can I rephrase it myself? Yes, please, okay, if you okay. can. It would be nice. <clears throat> My brother re called himself a nation builder, mm -hmm. yet he reverts to the apartheid terminology that was used for the different cultural groups, as in black and white. Now, how do you build a nation and yet re-emphasize that there's superiority and inferiority because black and white means superior and inferior. Oh, okay. I, I think I get it now. All right. <laughs> yeah, I think my, 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 all my, my characters are all equal. They are all equal. And... <laughs> One, 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 one other thing is that we, we write books as, as, as writers or as authors. And I think that is a God-given, maybe authority or, or something, for, for us to, 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 to do that. But if wrong people can tell stories of apartheid to the people, they, 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 they tell them to, to, to benefit something, to get something from them. To own them, or, or, to, or to, there is something that they want back from those people. They are not just telling stories, and that is why the, the story of the past, or the truth about our lives, even even today between blacks and whites in our country, must be told by people who will research and make sure that they use those stories to build, not to destroy. But our children need to know the truth. Thank you. That's very why we much. had the truth commission in this country. Thank you very much, uh, Dracarello and uh, Joanne. And thank you very much. You've been a lovely, lovely, lovely audience. And uh, I'm going to give these books. Who should we give them to? That lovely man uh, who said he's not that clever in the red shirt. I think these books belong to you. Thank you very much. Um, And after the break, we are going to have Jude Dibia and uh, Graham Reid, and facilitated by Sarojini Inada, discussing Africa writing queer identity. Thank you very much.